speaker. <clears throat> Sometimes it's very helpful to set the record straight, as a friend from Tennessee talked about earlier. Um, and I thought that would be highly appropriate, given uh, some of the lighthearted and sometimes uh, mean-spirited uh, barbs that have been sent the way of uh, former governor, vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin. So I just want to set the record straight, Mr. Speaker, so that people understand and the congressional record will properly reflect just how prescient that Sarah Palin has been in the past. We're going back <laughs> of five and a half years. But this was an interview that Charles Gibson did that gave rise to us a Saturday Night Live skit. But this was Charles Gibson quoting verbatim from him and then Sarah Palin. Let me ask you about specific national security situations. Let's start, because we are near Russia, let's start with Russia and Georgia. The administration has said we've got to maintain the territorial integrity of Georgia. Do you believe the United States should try to restore Georgian sovereignty over South Ossetia and Abkhazia? Sarah Palin, first off, we're going to continue good relations with Kasats Vila there. I was able to speak with him the other day and giving him my commitment as John McCain's running mate that we will be committed to Georgia. And we've got to keep an eye on Russia. For Russia to have exerted such pressure in terms of invading a smaller democratic country unprovoked is unacceptable. And we have to keep, Gibson interrupted and said, you believe unprovoked? Palin, I do believe unprovoked. And we've got to keep our eyes on Russia under the leadership there. Gibson, what insight into Russian action, particularly in the last couple of weeks, does the proximity of this state give you? And this is the operative line here. Sarah Palin said, quote, they're our next door neighbors, and you can see Russia from land here in Alaska. Gibson, you're in favor of putting Georgia and Ukraine into NATO, and the interview goes on. But that's what Sarah Palin said. They're our next-door neighbors, and you can actually see Russia from land here in Alaska. And that should be relevant to people. If, if you're living next door uh, on one acre of land, and the people that own the acre next to you uh, have been guilty in the past of breaking into other neighbors' sheds and, and uh, uh, buildings, then certainly that's something that you ought to be watching more closely than people on the other side of the town that don't live next door. I mean, proximity can be an important matter. But here is the, uh, the text of what Saturday Night Live did on September 13, 2008, and we know that Saturday Night Live uh, has altered sketches that in the past, uh, at least once, I recall seeing, where they were afraid it might make President Obama look bad, and they certainly didn't want to do that. Okay to take shots at Republicans, but uh, they certainly didn't want to be fair and uh, hit back at President Obama the same way. And uh, even as Lord Michaels, uh, comic genius that he is, has uh, indicated, yeah, they do lean left there at Saturday Night Live. This was uh, a sketch involving Tina Fey as Sarah Palin, Amy Poehler as Hillary Clinton. They were appearing together in the sketch, and these quotes are verbatim from the sketch. Tina Fey as Sarah Palin says, quote, but tonight we're crossing party lines to address the now very ugly role that sexism is playing in the campaign, unquote. 
then Amy Poehler as Hillary Clinton, quote, an issue which I am frankly surprised to hear people suddenly care about, unquote. Tina Fey as Palin, you know Hillary and I don't agree on everything. Poehler as Clinton says anything. I believe that diplomacy should be the cornerstone of any foreign policy. Then Tina Fey, acting as Sarah Palin, said, and I can see Russia from my house. So that is where the line came from. There's many in the United States uh, that actually believe Sarah Palin said, and I can see Russia from my house. It was a very clever sketch. It was funny. Um, I laughed when I saw it. But I also knew how intelligent and what a great uh, leader and governor Sarah Palin had been and what a great leader she is. Uh, but we can all laugh at ourselves. I just didn't realize that that was going to take off. And by the uh, writers at Saturday Night Live giving uh, uh, Hillary Clinton a line that said anything, um, I believe that diplomacy should be the cornerstone of any foreign policy, sounding like uh, a diplomat or a politician, and then trying to make uh, Sarah Palin sound very much less so, when actually the best quote remembered from Hillary Clinton will probably go down as uh, the statement made here on Capitol Hill in reference to the four American heroes serving in harm's way whose lives were taken by radical Islamists in an act of terrorism that had nothing to do with the video, and our Secretary of State, having suffered a blow to the head, we were told, that kept her from testifying originally, she was able to say, what difference at this point does it make? Not realizing, obviously, that when Americans are murdered who are working for this government and even working uh, for her as, with her as the boss, it is rather important to find out precisely why those people were murdered. In fact, uh, some Libyans told me that very thing back uh, uh, before Christmas. They said, so many Americans want to know who killed your four Americans. That's important. But an even more important question is why they were killed. So we have Hillary Clinton, who is saying, at this point, what, does it, what difference does it make why they were killed, how they were killed, and just the reverse of the way Saturday Night Live made those two individuals look through the caricature. Sarah Palin called the shot with Ukraine years ago. I would say prophetic, but it's not prophetic. It is a bit, but it has more to do with someone who has studied international relations, understands leaders like Putin, understands their lust for power and understands they've got to be stopped instead of carrying a plastic button over to dogmatic totalitarian, totalitarian wannabe leaders of Russia and saying, here, let's press this button and we'll Restart, reset everything. That's no way to conduct foreign policy. The greatest strides in the security and safety and acquiring the security and safety of the world have come when people knew they were dealing with an evil empire and stood up to it. I was asked just shortly ago, why did you vote no 
on the bill that was brought to the House floor to provide money, give loans to the Ukrainian people. I developed a great love and care for Ukrainian people as a college student uh, on a summer exchange program. And I found a, a lot of commonality with college students, some of the college students there in the Ukraine. In Ukraine. Um, I, I made the mistake of saying the Ukraine, Mr. Speaker, but one of my Ukrainian college friends correct me, um, when I was there as an exchange student said, do you say I'm going home to the Texas? And I said, no. And he said, we don't say the Ukraine. You come to Ukraine. Doesn't need the article the. So they're in Ukraine. People are suffering. They feel the boot of Russian power coming at them at first from the Crimea, and it may go farther. And I, I understand, having been there a number of times in Ukraine, that there are parts of Ukraine that have sympathies with Russia, that love the days of the Soviet Union, when they didn't have to look for a job themselves, the government would tell them how far they were allowed to go in school. They would tell them what their job would be. And if you step out of line, you could go to Siberia. They actually miss those days. Whereas most Ukrainians seem to have that yearning that George W. Bush talked about as president, a yearning to be free. Not all people have it, as we've seen. Some prefer security over complete freedom. And that needs to be understood. But as Franklin was quoted, paraphrased as saying, those who would give up liberty for security deserve neither. But I know there were, there were Soviets after the fall of the Iron after the demise of the Soviet Union, who were panic-stricken. You mean i got to find a job? I mean, the government's always told me everything to do. But I'll never forget being in Ukraine in recent years and had gone with a Ukrainian translator friend. Uh, my uh, Russian has gotten pretty bad since uh, college, not having any need to use it. But uh, we were in a Ukrainian restaurant. It was off the beaten road, and so it was mainly Ukrainians there. But in one area of the restaurant, there was a very large extended Russian family. That was clear, and the patriarch was clearly uh, Russian, speaking Russian. He appeared to have had too much to drink. And when the, the little trio came by with a couple with musical instruments and one, a young uh, Ukrainian with an incredible operatic voice, uh, and they would perform uh, at tables and, and do requested songs. But they came over to the, the extended table with the extended Russian family, and the patriarch um, called out that he wanted to hear uh, Moscow Nights, and I bet the group knew Moscow Nights, but they said they didn't know that. Um, so they asked for another song, and they performed it. It was magnificent. And then the boisterous the Russian patriarch said, and the translator was helping me, he said, we, we, don't, we never knew why you in Ukraine wanted to pull away from Russia. You know, we love you Ukrainians. We love you. We, we wanted to stay together as brothers. We n never understood Ukraine wanting to pull away and not be part of Russia. And he, the guy was probably late 20s, maybe 30, that was the singer. And he very politely said, uh, 
in Russian to the Russian. Um, have you been here to Kiev before? And the Russian said, yes, but it's been perhaps 20 years. And the young Ukrainian said, ah, so how do you find it now compared to 20 years ago? And the Russian patriarch, having had too much to drink, said, uh, it's magnificent. You've done a fantastic job. Oh, we love all of the buildings, all the growth, all the wonderful things you've done here. We want to be brothers, but you've done a magnificent job. And the, uh, the young Ukrainian singer yelled, that's why we wanted to be apart from Russia. You kept us suppressed. You took away the best we had. You stepped on us. You mistreated us. You would not let us reach our potential. That's why we want to be separate from Russia. That's why we separated from Russia. That's why we do not want to be part of Russia. You took the best we had and left us nothing. We can do much greater things when you allow us as Ukrainians to be in charge of Ukraine. And I, I wanted to stand up and give the young man a standing ovation. Um, I, I was just thrilled that he felt so strongly and so passionate about Ukrainian freedom. There are so many in Ukraine that feel that way. They don't want the Russian boot on their throat. Some are not aware that when perhaps the most evil man of the 20th century Hitler, Hitler's forces marched into Ukraine. They were actually met initially with 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 banners and and uh, lauding the the Ukrainians looked upon them as liberators from Russia. And if they had not been so consumed by the ridiculous. Uh, super race mentality that they'd sold themselves on, they would have recognized that the Ukrainians would have helped them. But instead, they brutalized them, wantonly killed Ukrainians, and forcefully turned Ukrainians against the Nazis. Uh, had the Nazis not been so consumed with um, their narcissism and, and uh, self-aggrandizement, they probably could have used the Ukrainians' help and never suffered such brutal uh, winter in Russia as they did. That's history. And I'm very proud that we have a former governor from Alaska that understands people like Putin, understands that Putin may have suffered from a debility that Stalin did. Stalin described it. Uh, the English translation was with power dizziness. So it's a little bit dizzy. Gee, let's take the Crimea because he has done as Khrushchev did of our late great president uh, John Kennedy. Kennedy was a brilliant man. There was no question he was a man of courage as illustrated during World War II. We're told that he was taking a uh, um, number of medications when they met in Vienna the summer of 1961. But he also acknowledged after his meeting with Khrushchev that Khrushchev just brutalized him and seemed a bit embarrassed with how he performed. Khrushchev, on the other hand, had said he was he was immature, he was weak. That was, was his assessment of Kennedy because he already knew he had backed Kennedy down uh, 
during the Bay of Pigs when the plan that was hatched during the Eisenhower administration, um, Kennedy was apprised of, but then it was changed. Kennedy takes office as our president, and he finds out there is going to be more American involvement. And unfortunately, three days, within three days of the invasion to be launched into the Bay of Pigs to attempt to overthrow Fidel Castro in Cuba, uh, President Kennedy got cold feet pull back on the support that was going to be offered and provided. Uh, the people were devastated. They were taken prisoners. It was a disaster. Kennedy said later he would have preferred an all-out invasion to appearing so weak. Words to that effect. And then the meeting between Khrushchev and Kennedy in Vienna, I believe it was June of 1961, reaffirmed in Khrushchev's mind that this was a weak, immature leader. And then toward the end of July of 1961, President Kennedy gave a powerful speech basically making clear that we have a commitment to West Berlin, we have a commitment to West Germany, and we would not, under any circumstances, allow the Russians to prevent us, the Soviets to prevent us, from making good on our promises. He even used the word force. We didn't want to use force, but if it was required, it would be used. Khrushchev had already taken his measure of the man, knew he could push him further, and the Berlin Wall began being built, and the United States did nothing, and it reaffirmed in Khrushchev's mind that what he had assessed in Vienna, that Kennedy was immature, was weak, was even more true than he had thought before. He knew he could push this man, and as a result, he was willing to risk thermonuclear war to put missiles with nuclear weapons into Cuba. He would never have been so brazen as to put nuclear weapons or missiles within 90 miles of Florida had it been for his repeated assessment in the first year of John Kennedy's presidency that he was weak. Well, he misread him. He showed, Kennedy showed weakness in 1961 at least three times, but he did have courage. It just took him a while to get up to it. But as a result of the weakness that was assessed by Khrushchev, we almost came to mutually assured destruction where the Soviet Union and the United States would have launched nuclear weapons toward each other. It was a very, very dangerous time for the world. We are now under the administration of President Barack Obama, and I cannot imagine any Russian leader perceiving anything but just absolute weakness as a leader when they heard what the microphone picked up when President Obama basically has said before the election, you know, just, you know, tell Putin after the election I'll have a lot more flexibility. The message was clear. I'm willing to cave on all kinds of things. I have to just look strong right now, but I'll cave on all kinds of things once we get past the 2012 election. For all the things that he is, Putin is not stupid. He knew exactly what that message was, though most of the voters in the 2012 election did not. And as a result, 
of that and so many other things, Russia believes they can cow America and we will not stand up when this president draws red lines. They won't be enforced. I want to go back to uh, something Sarah Palin pointed out in her interview. And this is actually in Newsbusters. It talks about the interview that Sarah Palin gave with Charlie Gibson and sets the record straight. But Palin foresaw that because of Putin's actions and Russia's movement against Georgia, that if we did not send a very clear message that such offensive border neglecting actions were not rebutted, then there would be other invasions to follow. She has been skewered um, for saying back at, uh, in 2008 that you know, if Russia was not stopped, then next they would move against Ukraine. She was belittled for that. And yet, she had read Vladimir Putin far better than anybody in this administration. She knew what they were capable of. She knew what they wanted to do. She knew there's only one way to, to, to deal with bullies, and it's not to repeatedly give them your lunch money. If you com continue to attempt to appease bullies, not only will they continue to take more and more and more, but they will have no respect for you whatsoever. That is also a problem we have had with radical Islamist leaders in the world. They understand one thing, that's strength. That's why the Marines, the United States Mar Marines, were sent to the shores of Tripoli. It was not the negotiations that Thomas Jefferson and others engaged in with the Barbary pilot, the, uh, pirates, those uh, radical Islamists. They didn't do any good. It was not until the Marines fought as bloody and tough or tougher than the radical Islamists, they realize, gee, we better leave these guys alone. But for the valiant, fervent fighting of the Marines, then we would have continued to have to pay huge portions of our United States budget for extortion to get our, our, uh, our sailors back. Sarah Palin understood that. She understood that you've got to stand up to bullies. So I think it's important that the congressional record properly reflect that Sarah Palin had it right. Saturday Night Live assessed her wrong. Sarah Palin had Putin pegged. She had the actions of Russia pegged. She knew what they would do next. So what have we done? The Ukrainian borders are violated by Russia and we want to go by as our friend is being brutalized, assaulted, and throw money at our friend who is being brutalized. That's not much of a friend. If I'm being assaulted, I would hope a friend would stop and help me and not just throw money who have known associations with radical Islamists. The 
Egyptian paper back when it was controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood bragged that they had six Muslim brothers who were top advisors and top positions in this administration. So we're not allowing our FBI, our intelligence officials, agents, to be trained to properly see this threat. So the Russians say, hey, this guy's a threat to you. You better check him out. And you'll find out what we're talking about. He had been to an area where people were often radicalized. He, <laughs> he had gone to an area that he came to America claiming asylum, to need asylum from, and he goes back to that area? Well, that should have been a red flag right there. He didn't need asylum from that area. He just went back there and got radicalized. But our blinded FBI agents were not able to ask those questions. And when I chided the director for not even going out to the Muslim mosques to talk to people out there, to ask questions, to find out if the Sarniavs had been radicalized. The uh, FBI director said that they did go out there to the mosque. I didn't hear it at the time, but I heard it on the replay when he adds, as part of our outreach program, <laughs> they didn't go out there to investigate the Sarniavs to save Bostonians' lives. He didn't even know that the Islamic Society of Boston was started by a man named Alamudi, who is in prison for 23 years for supporting terrorism. After being a very important advisor, he helped uh, find Muslims to go into the military as Muslim chaplains. He helped the Clinton administration. He actually helped the uh, George W. Bush administration early on until they figured out, whoa, this guy's supporting terrorism. And they had him arrested, I believe it was 2003, out at Dulles Airport. And he's in prison now because they recognize what he, what he is. But our FBI director, the FBI agents didn't even know you had a terrorist supporter that started the mosque where the Sarniavs went. So when the Russians see that we give America, that we don't really like, we don't really trust, but we give them a heads up to actually save American lives, and even with a heads up like they gave us, we can't properly protect the people of Boston because of political correctness in this administration. It just adds to the assessment by Putin and the other leaders in Russia that these are people that don't recognize danger when it's pointed out to them with a big sign danger on it. So, of course, just like Khrushchev's assessment that turned out in the end to be wrong, I hope and pray that we don't get to the brink of nuclear war because leaders around the world have assessed, as Khrushchev did, that the American president is weak and can be pushed around indefinitely. I don't think uh, President Obama can be pushed around indefinitely, but I sure don't want him to be pushed all the way to nuclear war before we finally take a stand, as Kennedy did. And you don't have to get that far if you stand up against the bullies early on, as Neville Chamberlain was not willing to do. And as a result, millions and millions died. Millions suffered unthinkable, tragic suffering. Because leaders wanted to go the appeasement route. For all the flack Sarah Palin has taken, she had Russia pegged. And it's not because she ever said, I can see Russia from my house. She never said that. She accurately said, you can see Russia from parts 
of Alaska, not her house, but she was willing to laugh at, at the sketch. But now we're not talking about laughable things. We're talking about freedom being taken at the point of military weapons in Crimea, in Ukraine. We see China moving in areas and places they've never had the courage to move because they knew America would not stand for it and we would rally other nations against China. And the Chinese leaders know that at times as good as the economy seemed to be going, they, they are a fragile economy. As I've said before, I think if China knew that they could call all the debt of the United States and push us into a bankruptcy type mode in the United States, they would, except they would suffer dramatically. And if they ever get to the point that they think they can take this nation down financially without losing their own, they would do it. And that's why it is a terrible wrong as a government to allow ourselves to become further and further indebted to China. And today, apparently, news we were seeing, their economy has taken a hit today. Look forward to finding out more about that this evening. But it's time Americans woke up, Mr. Speaker, and realized appeasement of bullies, of thugs, has never worked. It will never work. And when you're the most powerful, have the most powerful military in world history in the face of growing bully power, you don't abandon yours. We want to help those who cannot feed themselves in America. We want to help those who cannot provide for themselves in America. Certainly, we differ on our side of the aisle. For those who are able-bodied and can work, let's get the economy going so that people have a job and can do for themselves and make more. Let's don't continue to make people more and more dependent on the government. And I know my friends across the aisle do not want to see the world fall into war as it did in World War II, do not want to see us come to the brink of thermonuclear annihilation as it almost did during President Kennedy's term. But it is important to understand from history that's where you go when you show weakness. And, and we can defend ourselves without putting tens of thousands or a 100,000 troops into a country like we did in Afghanistan. For heaven's sake, we defeated the Taliban with less than 500 Americans in there helping the Northern Alliance. We helped them with weapons. We helped them with air cover. We helped them with intel. And they defeated our enemy for us. And this administration will point to the, the Northern Alliance and call them war criminals because they fought like the Taliban fought. We can fight our enemies by empowering the enemy of our enemies. They're Muslims. We can live with the Northern Alliance as long as they don't ever turn on us. But as long as they're going to fight our enemy, then let them fight our enemy. And yet for the government that was given to Afghanistan at our pushing regional country like Afghanistan was given a strong centralized government that would lead to nothing but corruption. They should have known it when it happened. So how do we deal with the problem there? 
as my friend, former Vice President Massoud, said, you help us get an amendment into our Constitution that allows us to elect our governors, elect our mayors, pick our own police chiefs, take that power away from the appointment power of the, of the president, and we can protect our regions, and we can keep the Taliban from taking over. But this administration has not, doesn't seem to want to push for something like that. Can't even get a status of forces agreement that was teed up completely for them by President Bush in Iraq and then was fumbled by this administration. I was meeting, had a visit with uh, Blue's friend today. If you have done homework, you know, Mr. Speaker, that the Taliban is apparently getting supplied mainly from Pakistan. And much of the supplies come through the more southern area, the Baluch area, Pakistan. We also know that the Baluch have been, have been victimized, oppressed, persecuted, killed, terrorized by the Pakistani military, the Pakistani government. And Iran has done the same thing because the Baluch people are indigenous to the southern part of Pakistan and on in to the most minerally rich areas of Iran. So we don't have to go to war with Iran. We don't have to go to war with Pakistan. But if you start assisting the Baluch people to stop the oppression and perhaps have their own independent country, the Taliban stopped getting supplied by Pakistan. Iran doesn't have all of the minerals. They have those mineral areas, a, a big part of an important part of them at least, are run by the Baluch people, and we can do business with them. There are ways to deal with the enemies of our enemies so that they keep areas around the world in check so you don't have to lose so much American lives. Most people are not aware most Americans have been killed under the administration of this president. It's time we stood firm. It's time we let the bullies of the world know Sarah Palin was right and we need to stand up to them. And with that, I yield back. None of the speakers announced power. Throw money on the way by. And in fact, we have agreements in writing that require more than simply throwing money at Ukraine when they're being brutalized by Russia. Russia's economy is not all that strong. And I don't know if Ukraine would uh, get this desperate or not, but we know that Putin, just to show Ukraine that they can, can hurt them, has stopped the flow of natural gas before and would obviously be willing to do it again. But Russia has very long pipelines that run through Ukraine. Perhaps at some point, Ukraine will get desperate enough to say, well, they may have a very weak leader over in the United States who will not come help us, but something we can do to hurt you, Mr. Putin. You do one more thing, and those pipelines of yours that bring you so much money into your treasury will be history. And then see how you do. I hope it never gets to that point. I hope that Russia doesn't continue to push matters until they put it, push us, as Khrushchev did, to the brink of world war again. But in seeing the debate between President Obama and Governor Romney, in which 
President Obama chided him by saying, you know, the 1980s called and they want their foreign policy back. We've now seen the appeasement repeatedly of this administration. And that's why I've said before that Neville Chamberlain called to this administration. He wants his foreign policy back because it appears it's being utilized once again. It didn't work for England against Hitler, and it will not work now against Russia and Putin. I was very small as a kid in elementary school, but I learned early on, I may get my nose bloodied, but I'm going to make the big bully hurt. And when I made him hurt enough, after he had bloodied my nose, he left me alone. He could have hurt me. But it doesn't matter how you're, whether you're big or small. If you want to deal with bullies by appeasement over and over and over again, then it's clear you're going to continue to encourage bullying. I was never for bullying. I would stand up to it as a young kid in elementary school, and I'm for standing up against it when we have the most powerful military in the history of the world uh, until this administration finishes with it. We still do for now. But I see my dear friend, Dr. Michael Burgess from Texas, and I would yield to him for whatever time he wants to use. Mr. Speaker, I send to the desk a privilege report from the Committee on Rules for filing under the rule. The clerk will report the title. Report to accompany House Resolution 515, resolution providing for consideration of the bill H.R. 3189 to pro prohibit the conditioning of any permit, lease, or other use agreement on the transfer, relinquishment, or other impairment of any water right to the United States by the securities of the Secretaries of the Interior and Agriculture, providing for consideration of the bill H.R. 4015, to amend Title 18 of the Social Security Act to repeal the Medicare Sustainable Growth Rate and improve Medicare payments for physicians and other professionals and for other purposes, and providing for the proceedings during the period from March 17, 2014 through March 21, 2014. Refer to the House calendar and, and order printed. Gentleman from Texas may resume. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank my friend uh, from Texas for such a lovely speech. Very touching. Well, here's something else that's pretty powerful. Sarah Palin in her speech, conservative political action committee in March 8, 2014 said this, those policies that the cabinet have to explain and justify, how do you convey to Putin the threat that sounds like, Vladimir, don't mess around or you're going to feel my flexibility because I've got a phone and I've got a pen and um, I can dial real fast and poke you with my pen, pinky promise. Well, obviously she was having some fun herself. But she makes the point, a phone and a pen won't do it when you're talking about a bully that does not mind violating borders, killing people, subjugating masses of people. you got to stand up to them. I think one of the clear indications not only that we had a weak administration on foreign policy, but also... Uh, we didn't use common sense in protecting ourselves, came very clearly before the Boston bombing when the Russians, who don't particularly, the Russian leaders, Russian people like us pretty well, but the Russian leaders don't like us particularly and certainly don't respect us. But even so, they realize that we actually have a common enemy, and that's radical Islam. Radical Islam that would love to see Russia fall, 
Ukraine fall, United States fall. We'd love to see that all fall under a giant global caliphate. So we have that common enemy who wants to destroy each of our ways of life. So Russia, despite dislike and distaste in some ways for the United States, actually reached out and said, hey, we're not sure you realize, but this Sarniev, he's been radicalized. He's dangerous. We're not going to reveal any too much secrets here, but any intelligent administration will take what we have said that Sarniev is dangerous, he's been radicalized, he's a threat to you, and do some digging. And the best we can find out, even after questioning the director of the FBI, the best we can find out is uh, they apparently went and talked to Sarniev himself. Well, okay, I guess you got to do that. Good idea. If somebody's very good at questioning, if somebody really understands the radical Islamist mind, if he knows who the Islamic authors are that have inspired radicalism, if he knows who the imams are that has helped radicalize people, then you can ask the right questions about which imams you've been around. What authors are your favorite authors? What do you think of Qutb? in Egypt, and the writing that he had, that milestone that Osama bin Laden credited with helping radicalize him. If you know the questions to ask, you can find out whether someone has really been radicalized. But, as a few of us have found out, when we reviewed the material purged from FBI training material, we're not allowing our FBI agents to be properly trained as to the threat and the beliefs of radical Islamists. And again, as one of our intelligence officers has told me, you know, we have blinded ourselves of the ability to see our, our enemy. And it continues. And we continue to have people advise this administration